you are in any relationship uh, where you're there as a professional and especially as a psychotherapist, um, you are there in a position of power. And there is nothing wrong with power. There is nothing wrong with power in terms of the power of a parent and the child. It is the abuse and inappropriate use of power that's the problem. Now, sometimes there is a confusion between power and powerlessness. And with some schools of thought uh, in the UK, the issue of power is that there should be no difference between therapist and, and, and client. I don't agree with that, but I do agree that power comes with responsibility. So I had to adjust my way of working fairly radically. At the same time, the bit about my background, which has always been useful, is the ability to carry very clear boundaries and very clear distinction between what is my world, what is my pathology, and what is the client's, so that the two don't get intertwined and mixed. Uh, But it did mean things like (coughs) looking very much at nonverbal expressions of someone's um, difficulties, so that words which are so important in psychoanalysis and in the early days of psychotherapy remain important but they are only one part of understanding someone's um, mental state. That the non-verbal clues are just important. The body movements are just important. And of course when we start looking in the complexity of DID we see that even in the assessments all of these issues are really important. And that things like silence, um, which is <clears throat> so much part of psychoanalysis that you leave someone in silent, this is a very much more complicated area because you have to know whether the silence is one of someone who has sufficient ego strength to be able to tolerate the silence. Or, as in the case of certainly the early part of any work of complex trauma, the silence is a place where someone is at a danger of experiencing absolute disintegration. So that for a lot of people, silence is actually a terror. Silence and emptiness is more terrifying than finding themselves repeating relationships that are abusive or putting themselves in a place of danger like self-harming or anything that keeps the um, feeling of aliveness intact. Whereas anything to do with calmness, which of course is part of what we're trying to establish in the therapeutic relationship, to be able to tolerate um, reflection, thinking, calmness, is very terrifying and frightening. So I would say that's one of the more fundamental issues that I had to be able to understand. And trouble to us, people, and this was here, people are often very uh, avoidant. Very, very avoidant. Uh, avoidant of the inner worlds and yep. the traumatic memories correct. and the dissociated parts. Yeah, correct. Can you tell me what is your approach when you work psychoanalytical with, with this? Because the psychoanalytical work is traditionally quite passive. Correct. Uh, well, that's the, you're, you're, you're right to bring this up because, of course, um, the other area, um, I find myself much more active. And I think it, it is a weaving in of times of being very active. Um, The more someone, in the early time, the more someone is um, quiet and says very little, the more I find myself talking to try and help someone feel connected through my talking, through my being taking the active part. If someone comes for the first time and is very busy, very loud, walks around, um, talks, talks to me as though they've known me for years, I keep very quiet. Because all along, really from the moment, once, from my point of view, from my experience, the moment um, one is engaged with, with your client, once I'm engaged, the whole approach is about trying to regulate the affect, trying to regulate the emotional um, charge. Um, I've forgotten your first question <laughs> just now. I think you were saying... It was so, uh, about the activity level, the, the avoidance of... OK, yeah. thank you. Um, I see... It, I don't... You see, avoidance is a word that's got um, a mixture of meanings. I mean, technically it's an avoidance, but I start on the basis that whatever is going on in the defence system is to survive. When you, I mean, when you actually are, as a child, for instance, growing up with a neurological system that is too new and too underdeveloped in any case, when you've got a situation where you're overwhelmed 
with the emotional impact of what's going on, whether it's to do with attachment, whether it's to do with physical or sexual abuse, the only criteria to be able to survive is to find a way of avoiding so that the dissociation is a very successful avoidance, if you're going to use that word. But actually it's a successful way of separating out what would be impossible to deal with. In the same way you could say that um, we all do that to some extent if we look at things on television and they are look, showing some of the terrible scenes we see across the world, whether it's starvation in parts of Africa or some of the, uh, the battles that go on, which includes uh, um, young teenage um, children, then the, we, we naturally will blot out, we will avoid... Um, more than we can tolerate. We will see it, but we will not see it as well. And, it, and it's a degree of that. So that, to begin with, um, had someone not done that, I'm not sure they would have psychologically survived as well as those that, for however many years, do block it off. The question is, the problem is, it's no longer necessary as an adult um, but it is still templated in so successfully that this defense mechanism is, remains as a sort of default position. That's where the problem is, so that someone is finding themselves um, avoiding emotional connection where there is no reason to do that, in the way that some um, mothers, for instance, will t- who are dissociative will talk about having children there and they are watching themselves um, being with the children but can't emotionally feel connected that's, that's a system that is no longer it's not a dangerous system, quite a situation quite the opposite is one of potential for loving care for their own children and yet it is so well templated in that they can only be alongside themselves playing or communicating with their children So, in your, in your experience how do patients deal with, for example, their traumatic memories in a psychoanalytic setting? Well, I mean, I, I'm someone who is very um, keen on the, the um, notion of, stru- of uh, three, three-phase treatment because I think one of the problems that can happen is that someone who eventually um, their defense system start breaking down will uh, present themselves to maybe psychiatric services or will find themselves a therapist and will immediately start um, offloading um, their trauma history and um, it's the opposites that's needed to begin with uh, that, that you have to first of all and so if someone's coming for the first time and I start hearing about the trauma history whether it's from the person who's presenting themselves or from a dissociated part, I will very gently and politely say this is not an area we can go yet. Because till the relationship, and of course the relationship between therapist and client remains the most important uh, tool for change, is established till I learn their rules. And of course someone of dissociation will have an internal structure that is there to protect them. So one of the dangers about um, trauma coming out early on is not only does it destabilize because we haven't established a relationship, but there could be an internal protective system that actually um, punishes the person afterwards for having offloaded um, secret information about their past, which the whole system has been programmed or geared to be able to say never talk to someone. So you may have someone coming to see you who says I'm so relieved that I've been able to tell you uh, this traumatic history will feel better, go away, and then you find next time they come they've cut themselves seriously. And in the early days I didn't know that, but then I began to realize this is an internal protector who is saying you know, you have no right to start talking about issues of trauma Till, till the system has given you permission. And that means that I have to establish a relationship with what can often appear to be the most angry, volatile, violent part of that person's personality. Because power, it's back to power is power. And power, internal power, if it's there, however maladaptive it is, it is still power. If you're going to have an impact as a therapist, you have to reach out and understand the rules of what's going on in, in that person's internal world. Okay. Well, <coughs> when you eventually come there, right, you, you pick up this internal 
Yeah. Permission. To yeah. Talk, uh, how do they deal with this thing? Well, <coughs> um, one of the. Um, I'll come about it slightly a different way. One of the things that have evolved in, in, in the UK is whereas in the UK it's taken years for the psychiatric services generally to start accepting the, the existence and the, and, uh, of dissociation. Um, and several of us have done a lot of work to change that. That's probably my main area of work now is to try and help and educate the uh, psychiatric system to set up the right treatment pro- protocol. Because, of course, as is familiar in, in Europe generally, everything is about shortening the treatment span. And we know that we need enough time to be able to establish with, with complex trauma over a period, or in my view, it needs to be often over periods of two to three years at a minimum um, to be able to take about change. Now, change means, in my experience, means that you have to, you don't look for any parts, but any part that comes out has to be able to tell its own trauma history. Enough to be able to process it, because trauma that has happened at different stages in someone's childhood is trapped in time, is one way of understanding. So it's left there frozen. It's never been processed or digested. And so it's no good trying to avoid that. The trouble is, having accepted the condition, a lot of psychiatric services are now saying, we will only talk to the outside part. We will only help strengthen the ego strength and deal with behavioural modification. So that you've got the outside part, what used to be called the host, is there willing to please and to try and learn to change, perhaps, but if none of the internal structure is able to come out, nothing changes. So that in answer to that, it's by developing not only two things. One is being able to facilitate different parts if they come out to process their material. But all the time, as the therapist, you are carrying the whole picture. So all the time is to make sure that you are... T- telling the whole system what's going on. So, for instance, if one part comes out and says, this is what happened, but I don't want you to tell it any, any other part, I have to say, I'm sorry. I have to, whatever's told to me, I have to be able to communicate to the whole in, a, in an appropriate way. I don't want to overwhelm the ANP if we're going to use that structural dissociation with too much of the emotional impact but if you as an EP start telling me something then when the AMP comes back then I will say to the AMP I just wanted you to know that so and so was there and they were starting to tell me about some of the difficult times that they had because what you're trying to do in a sense to use the structural model is be able to diminish the phobia of attachment 